Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I'd like to talk about plant hormones and plant responses. It is quite a remarkable phenomenon, as you see here, how plants seem to respond to light, as if they know to turn towards the sun. So this is one example of how plants respond to stimuli. In this case, the stimuli is light, and the response from the plant is to seemingly turn or bend towards the light. In general, plant responses can be divided into two types. There are the nastic responses, and there are the tropisms. A nastic response is movement response to stimuli from any direction. In other words, the stimuli could be from any direction. This type of response is usually a defense response to some touch. One of the characteristics of nastic responses is that they are reversible and they're repeatable. This is not the case for tropisms, as you will see. The famous Venus flytrap provides an example of a nastic response. Here, inside the mouth of the Venus flytraps are tiny hair-like projections, which when touched, the response is a closure of the mouth, trapping whatever organism there might have been. So, a nastic response is a movement response to stimuli from any direction. Tropism, on the other hand, is a growth response to stimuli. The stimuli is usually directional. Again, compared to the nastic response, which is a movement response and is reversible, tropism is a growth response to certain stimuli. And the direction of the stimuli reflects also the response. The bending of plants towards light source is an example of a tropism. Here the stimuli, of course, is light. And the direction of light will influence the response of the plant. In other words, in this case, the plant will bend towards the light. So in summary, plant responses can be classified as nastic responses or tropisms. Nastic responses are movement responses to stimuli from any direction. They are usually responses to touch and function as defense mechanisms. They are reversible and they can be repeated. On the contrary, tropisms are growth responses to stimuli. And the direction of stimuli is important in determining the response of the plant. Here are some examples of nastic responses. This is a Venus flytrap again. In this case, the hunt was successful. When tiny hair-like projections that you see over here are triggered, this triggers a response and closes the mouth shut. So the closure of the leaves of the Mimosa pudica plant right here, when they're touched, is another example of nastic response. The sudden shift of water pressure in these plants is responsible for such dramatic, seemingly volitional results. Here's another example of the same plant. So a mere touch here provokes a response from this plant. Again, this seemingly dramatic response is mediated by changes in water pressure in the leaves of the plant. Here are some examples of other tropisms. Besides phototropism, there is gravitropism. Gravitropism is a growth in response to gravity. The roots always grow towards the ground, and the shoot always grows away from the ground. Even if the pot were to be turned like this, the roots would somehow find their way towards the ground and the stem would always grow upwards like this against gravity. The twirling of the twine against adjacent structures is another example of a tropism. This response is due to touch. As the wine touches the adjacent structure, it wraps around these. So these are some examples of tropisms. Phototropism with the stimulized light, gravitropism with the stimulized gravity, and finally, this is thigmotropism. This is a growth response to touch or contact. Now in regards to gravitropism, as you can see over here in time lapse, even if the pot were turned sideways, the plant will adjust to this change by altering its growth pattern so that the stem grows towards the sky because that's where the light is. Here's the plant before it falls. As the plant falls, the roots again adjust their growth pattern so that they grow towards the ground and the stem alters its growth pattern so it grows towards the sky, towards the sun, where the light is so the photosynthesis can continue. This response is mediated by auxins. These are plant hormones that we shall briefly study today. Auxins make the roots grow down and auxins also make those stems go up. So this example of gravitropism is mediated by a plant hormone called auxin. If the plant response is towards the stimuli, that's called a positive response. 
In this case, the roots grow towards the ground. That's a positive geotropic response. If the response is away from the stimuli, in this case the stimuli is gravity, then that's called negative geotropism. For any stimuli, if the response is towards the stimuli, like in phototropism, that's called a positive response. And if the response is away from the stimuli, that's called a negative response. So in this case, the roots growing towards the ground is called a positive geotropic response. And the stem growing away from the gravity towards the sky, that's called a negative geotropic response. Now here again is a time-lapse photography. Quite remarkable, I think, actually, how a plant uses adjacent structures for support and growth. This response is touch-mediated. In other words, the growth pattern of this plant changes based on touch. This is called thigmotropism, that is, growth response to touch or contact. In review, there are two types of plant responses. Nastic responses, which are movement responses to stimuli, these are reversible responses, usually to touch. On the other hand, tropisms are growth responses to stimuli, and they are directional movement. Examples that were given were phototropism, response to light, geotropism, plant response to gravity, and thigmotropism, plant response to touch. Tropisms are mediated by plant hormones. If you recall, hormones are produced by endocrine cells, and they travel via blood and target cells are identified by receptors. Only those cells that have the receptors for the hormones will be influenced by the hormone. Cells that do not have receptors for the hormones will not be influenced. So this cell here will not be affected by the hormone because it does not have the appropriate receptor for the hormone. In plants, of course, there's no blood, thank God. Otherwise, every lawn mowing session would be a bloodbath. In plants, hormones travel via the vascular system or by diffusion from cell to cell. Once they reach their target, the hormone can affect the cell in different ways. In this example taken from human physiology, steroid hormone, for example, when it reaches the target cell, it diffuses into the cell and the receptor is in fact inside the cell. And this hormone receptor complex then moves to the nucleus, where inside the nucleus it binds the DNA, activating messenger RNA transcription. So in this case, the hormone receptor is inside the cell. Many times the hormone receptor is on the outside of the cell. And hormones affect the functioning of the cell in different ways. Here's a demonstration of how hormones travel via the bloodstream, at least in humans, and influence target cells. And as you can see here, hormones will only affect the cells that have the receptors for them. Some examples of plant hormones are the following. Auxins were apparently one of the first plant hormones to be discovered. They're responsible for phototropism, and they regulate growth of the plant in many different ways. Another example of plant hormones are cytokinins. They induce lateral bud growth, they inhibit senescence or growing old of plant, and they also affect seed germination. If the apical bud is removed from a plant, one observes that the lateral buds will grow. This response, that is the growth of the lateral buds, is mediated by cytokinins. I have noticed this in my own garden. When you cut the apical buds from a rose plant, the lateral buds grow and the plant becomes bushier. Ethylene apparently is the only known gaseous hormone. As you can see here, it promotes ripening of fruits. Gibberellins perhaps get the prize for the coolest name, stimulates stem elongation and seed growth, among other things. To get an appreciation of how these hormones work, we shall take a closer look at the auxins and how they produce their effect of phototropism. Auxins are found in young plant tissues. If you wanted to find auxins, you would look at young parts of the plant. This would include the fresh leaves, the apical buds, and the lateral buds. Auxins also affect the root growth and germinating seeds, etc. There are different types of auxins and they regulate plant growth in different ways. This is how phototropism works. Auxins, as stated, are produced in the apical buds and distributed equally among the cells. However, if the light is distributed unequally, that is, the plant gets light stimuli from a direction where it's unequally distributed, where one side of the plant gets more light than the other side, the auxins will also be distributed unequally. This occurs because light destroys some of the auxins and also promotes migration of the auxins to the dark side. There, they promote cell elongation. 
Notice here that the cells that they're affected, they don't cause them to divide. Simply, they cause them to stretch longer and become longer. As the cells on one side are longer compared to the other side, the plant seemingly bends towards the light. Again, auxins are initially equally distributed. But when light strikes the plant from a direction unequally, the auxins move away from the stimulus. And in those cells, it causes cell elongation. It is the auxin affected cells that elongate, which causes the plant to bend towards the light. Now, we shall look closely at one of these cells to see exactly how auxins cause them to elongate. So here's that one hypothetical cell. What we're going to do here is going to magnify the cell membrane and the cell wall. What auxins do over there is that auxins affect the hydrogen ion channels in the cell membrane. Just so that you understand, this is the cytoplasm of the cell, this is the plasma membrane, and this is the cell wall. The auxins stimulate the hydrogen ion channel, which results in movement of the hydrogen ions from inside of the cell towards the outside in the cell wall area. Inside the cell wall area, there are enzymes, and this acidic environment that is hydrogen ion rich environment activates these enzymes. Once these enzymes are activated, they start to break the cell wall. Not completely, just enough to make it a little looser. It's kind of like when you have a balloon. Before you start blowing up the balloon up, you kind of stretch it to make it a little loose. This loosening of the cell wall allows for the cell to stretch. What happens is that the cell wall now allows water to come inside the cell. So therefore, Water rushes into the cell and the cell swells and the cell therefore elongates. So auxins cause elongation of cell by affecting the hydrogen ion channels in the cell membrane, which creates a more acidic environment in the cell wall, activating enzymes that break down and loosen up the cell wall. This loosening up of the cell wall allows water to go into the cell, increasing the cellular turgor pressure and stretching the entire cell and elongating the cell. And this is what causes the plant to bend. The cells on the dark side, so to speak, of the shoot grow longer than the cells on the light side. This causes the shoot to bend towards the light. Now what happens now is that the plant will continue to grow towards the light. As we have stated, there are other types of tropism. Gravitropism is growth of the roots towards the earth, towards gravity. Thigmotropism also plays a role in how the roots grow, how the roots are able to avoid rocks and seemingly go around the rocks. Also, roots tend to grow towards water source, that's called hydrotropism. So in this cartoon picture, there are three examples of tropism, gravitropism, thigmotropism, and hydrotropism. One of the hormones that we mentioned were the gibberellins. Gibberellins are responsible for many things, including growth of fruits like this. The chubbier grapes here had more gibberellins. Gibberellins are also responsible for growth of seed. What you see before you here is a diagram of a seed. When the seed starts to germinate, initial roots or tiny roots are called rootlets, and the emerging stem needs energy. Because the seed is yet incapable of doing photosynthesis, it relies on the stored energy that it has for initial growth. The seed embryo releases gibberellins, and the gibberellins, in fact, are responsible for the breakdown of starches into usable forms of energy, such as glucose. The embryo releases the gibberellins, which activate enzymes that break down starch into smaller molecules and molecules such as glucose. What happens is illustrated over here. The whole thing here is the seed, and inside the seed is the embryo. On a lucky day, when the embryo gets water, the embryo absorbs the water and swells. It then releases gibberellins, as you can see over here, which diffuse into this aileron layer, where they trigger digestion of proteins into amino acids. Those amino acids that are released from here are used to make enzymes that are able to break down starch into glucose. So as you can see, gibberellins are very important for initial growth of the embryo. That was our brief survey of plant responses and plant hormones. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, as-salatu wa-salamu rasulillah wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum.